horsepower is on track, building its first performance road course machine. A 68 Mustang body, 347 Ford small block, and a race-worthy suspension. A tribute to Vika Edelbrock that you could win. But now on to phase two. Well, first off, we're going to handle a safety feature that's a must for any kind of track car, and that's a solid roll cage. Now, that might conjure up images of notching and welding and bending and so forth, but not this time. We're going to use one of these bolt-in cages from Auto Power, and well, they've done all the bending and MIG welding for us. Now, we've got it mocked up to give you an idea of how it's going to look inside the Mustang, and we've got the Mustang up on jack stands to make sure that the chassis is level all the way around. The first thing we want to do is get the rear hoop in place and as far back as we can. And attach the rear support braces so it stays upright. Not bad. I think fits nice. Then using the supplied 8 inch sleeves, install the two forward supports. Followed by the forward support braces and hold them in position with the sleeves. Finally, the windshield crossbar. I'm still going to throw a tape on this thing, but I almost don't have to. Every corner is almost perfect seam for seam. And check out the rear support braces. They have a little curvature on the mounting pad, which fits almost perfect to the wheel tub. For a pre-built cage, it doesn't get much better than this. Inch and 7 sixteenths, we're square. Then drill two holes through the floor and attach the reinforcement plate from the bottom. And use it as a template to drill the third hole. Notice how the plate forms to the floor, and do the same to all four corners. Now you might be interested in knowing that Auto Power makes these bolt-in cages for dozens of domestic and foreign rides, and I think one of the coolest features is these sleeves that hold the bars together while you bolt them in place. The uh, uncool part, well, we got 10 sleeves and 20 bolt holes to make, so we're going to be busy for a while. We recruited Chris and his uh, artistic skills to start making a home for our Mustang's Jazz Pro Sport fuel cell. This thing holds 16 gallons of fuel in a seamless cross-length inner shell. While he's making lots of annoying noise, we're going to install our Global West subframe connector. Now you've got to have these in a track car to prevent torsional twist on the corners. They attach to the front and back unibody frame rails. Well, at least it's supposed to. So much for our lucky streak. Now, with replacement shells, you got to expect a few little fitment issues, and we can't modify it, so see what we can do with this subframe. That's right. When in doubt, cut it out. We're just going to tack weld the connectors in place for now. And that's because we're going to use this jacking rail kit to add extra strength and literally create a place to jack up the car quickly without hurting the body seams. You clamp the inch square long rail along the rocker seam first, then the cross tube that connects it to the subframe connectors, and the second tube goes to the car's original front rail. The tubes are too close to the floor for a complete welding, so after everything's in place with tack wells, we have to drop the entire assembly, weld it all together, paint the top only to prevent rust. Then after it's back under the car, we can weld back that connector piece we had to remove because of our fitment problem. Finally, we box in this gap and weld it up. Finally, we get to see Chris's fuel cell craft work after he bolts in this bottom aluminum plate to close in the trunk compartment. Well, now he can drop in the steel case, bolt it up, and our cell finally has a new home. Well, I gotta say, I'm pretty impressed with how much progress the three of us have made so far in our allotted time, especially with that roll cage. I'm willing to bet that you, without a cameraman and director slowing you down, could build one in about an hour. Well, we got a lot more time ahead and a lot more work ahead, so hang with us. Yeah, we're back, and we're getting kind of anxious to get that Mustang off the jack sands and onto its own four feet. That is, if we had them. Before Mike can measure for wheels and tires, the front fenders need to be installed, and like our body shelves, the reproductions came from Dynacorn. Then we need to raise the suspension to ride height. 
How about a little wheel 101? Now the first thing you want to consider is offset. Every wheel has one and it's either zero, positive, or negative. Offset refers to the location of the hub mounting surface. For example, if it's even with the center line of the wheel, it's zero. If it's towards the back of the wheel, it's negative. And if it's towards the front, it's positive. You also need to know up front how wide you want your wheels to be. Here's a heads up though. For example, a wheel that's advertised at 8 inches is almost 9 inches wide from edge to edge. But manufacturers go by the width inside the lips, which is 8. So make sure you factor in the extra width for clearance. The first thing I'm going to do is hang this nut and string on the inside of the fender. Now this is going to let us know how far we can come out with the wheel since it still has to tuck underneath it. The straight edge is on a reference where the wheel sits on the hub. Now take your tape measure and go to the innermost point where the wheel can make interference, which in our case is the upper control arm. We're sitting at five inches, so take a quarter away from that, and our aft set will be four and three quarter. And we're still inside of our eight inch mark inside the fender well. If you're working with a metric offset like a Honda, Toyota, or Nissan, just remember that if you multiply the number in inches by 25.4, remember that it's 25.4, that'll give you the correct offset. So in our case, we're looking at about a 120 millimeter positive offset. Wheel size is only half of the equation. You also need to know how much tire you can get under there. Now the easiest way to that is get an ideal tire size in mind. We're thinking something about a 245-40, which has an overall diameter of 25 and a half inches. Here's where you need to pay attention. We bent this rod and this four and three quarter inch measurement represents where the mounting flange of the wheel to the inside of the tire is going to be. The 12 and 3 quarter inch measurement represents the overall diameter of the tire from the center line of the spindle. Now with it held in place, turn the wheel to the far right lock. This will show you how much clearance you have from the inside of the tire to the outside of the frame rail. To check the clearance to the outside of the fender, just reverse your measurement from the mounting flange to the outside of the wheel. There you go. You've been edumacated. We're next out back, more bodybuilding exercises and all these parts from the louvers to the lenses came from the year one catalog for early model Mustangs. Might as well get started with these rear quarter extensions. This is probably one of the few parts that we put on this thing one time and one time only. It's mostly about test fitting and every part that you see us put on this car comes off when it's time to paint. Look pretty close there, huh? Yep, we're good here. This with brackets not lined up, we gotta move it that way. Pull this back off. That should be good. Let's see how lucky we get. There it goes. Man, that's a nice fit. Check out the line up here between the headlight bucket and the hood. Yeah, and this part will come up once we get the hood latches on and of course the weight of the motor. By the way, we're not too far away from dropping in our favorite part to fit, that 347 small block. But this motor has to hang around for a little bit longer because we need to know how much room the steering is gonna take up in the engine compartment. And we can't figure that out until we know where we're gonna sit. Now to offset some of the driver's weight to the rear of the car, we're gonna move the seat back as far as possible. Now remember, this is a giveaway car, so we're also gonna build a bracket underneath the seat that has a couple mounting locations for driver's preference. Now some of you may be thinking, I'm sitting awful low. Well, we're also gonna bring that seat up with the bracket to have a perfect view out of the windshield. Now here's something to keep in mind with the steering. If you have it too far far forward, your range of motion gets shortened by your elbows hitting. So the closer you have it to you, the larger amount of range you get. Now for a measurement, let's check that out. Looks like 23 inches. With some one inch tubing, a blade, a bit, some heat. Oh, and don't forget the seat. This one came from Kirky. It's made of aluminum and it's a universal fit. Perfect for our track car. We're adding one more piece to the roll cage, and that's a dash bar. And to it, the first support bracket for the steering. Now we're welding the rest of the brackets to this Flaming River collapsible column. It mounts to a heim at the front and to the original column mount under the dash and back. Using the supply joints and double D shaft, connect the column to the rack. 
The distance from the driver to the steering wheel is perfect. With the bracket underneath the seat, I got a killer view out of the front windshield, and up top, plenty of room for my brain bucket. What more could I ask for? The motor, and it's coming up right after the brake. We're back with Horsepower's Mustang track car. Now with a solid roll cage inside for safety and a fuel cell out back for some go juice. We measured for wheels and tires and even pre-assembled some body parts. Before we drop the motor in, we've got one little problem. Some of you may have noticed where the rack was located. Well, there's no way that rear sump pan is gonna clear it. I guess that's a good thing about having spare parts around the shop. We found the right pickup and a front sump pan to take care of the problem. Pull it forward a little. Good. Our TKO 600 gearbox came from American Powertrain, and they sent it to us as a complete kit specifically for our 68. Now it has the correct shifter location, so there's little to no modifications needed for the trans tunnel. All the gears have been REM polished for super smooth high RPM shifts, and the input shaft is 26 spline, output shaft is 31. Now they've been cryogenically hardened to remove any imperfections in the metal and to strengthen them up. Now each transmission is assembled by a single person and it's rated to a thousand foot-pounds of torque. Now as far as the clutch goes, it's their Pro Grip brand and it's a low effort, high pressure diaphragm style plate with a full circle Kevlar disc, which offers a lot less chatter than a puck style. Now with it comes with a billet steel SFI quality flywheel, a bell housing, cross member, and all the rest of the hardware and pieces you need to install the complete setup. Now one of the cool things, if you're installing this thing at say two, three, four in the morning, they're one of the only aftermarket companies that offer full 24 hour customer service. The old flywheel was for dyno use only, so it's gone. First thing to go up is the engine plate, followed by the new flywheel and dowels. Now the disc and pressure plate are next. QuickTime supplied the spun high-grade steel bell housing, and now what that means is it's as tough as it looks. With the correct spacer, we can slide the Hydromax hydraulic release bearing onto the bearing retainer, place the transmission on a jack, and lift it into place. You lined up in there? No. You can't? <laughs> I wish it was that simple. I don't know why it won't go really. in. There it went. Once it's all seated, install the trans mount, and finally the cross member. Have you ever wondered how to measure for a U-joint? Well, the easiest thing to do is jump on the internet and get a list of the actual U-joint sizes. Then all you need is a tape measure or a set of dial calipers. Now the first thing we want to do is figure out the width from the inside of the cup mount, which is 3.625. Now measure for the actual cup diameter, which is 1.188. Now compare those measurements to a conversion chart, and that'll show you you got a 1350 U-joint. Now we need to take a measurement from the back of the transmission to the center of where the cup is on the seat in the rear yoke, which is 52 and a half inches. Now we know the length of the shaft we need to order. We knew we were going to have a tight fit, but not this tight. That's exactly why I put the steering in first. Instead of cutting the header up, we're gonna go ahead and move the steering over and bend it down towards the rack here. Now, even though it's a tighter bend, we're not gonna have any problems with the Flamin' River joints binding up. With the hymen insert in the right spot, see what I told you about the joints? No binding. The passenger side doesn't have anything in the way, so a nice fit was expected. For brakes, we're using this steel pedal assembly from Willwood. Now it's got two pedals on it, one for the clutch, one for the brake. Now the clutch has a slave mounted on the back side of it. The brake pedal has two masters mounted on the back of it. Now one for the front, one for the rear brakes. Now it's also got an adjustable bar which changes the bias from the front to the rear. It's an amount to the firewall with this backing plate on the front side. Hey, guess what? We got wheels and tires now. These are 18 inch center machine outer aluminum wheels, one piece for a rocket racing. And we wrapped them with G-Force R1s from BF Goodrich. Now these things are molded to a four 30 seconds of an inch tread depth, which means a couple of pace laps and you'll have them scuffed in and ready to go. Now they also have a tread wear rating of 40. What that means is the tread consistency is super soft and so that'll grip the track even better. Now, when I say soft, look at this. 
comes right off. Now, as a trade-off, of course, they're not gonna last as long, but that depends on your aggressive driving habits. Plus, the vintage look of these wheels brings out the nostalgia in all of us. And just like cars from the old days, this one's developed a serious attitude. Now for the exhaust. And the plan is to run two pieces of pipe to about here, mount both of our mufflers, and then more pipe to say here. Then we'll have the exhaust exit in front of the rear tire with a set of these. Now we got them from mandrelbendingsolutions.com in various lengths to cover all of our options. To lower the decibels in our track car, we're using these Magnaflow 5x8 race mufflers. Now they're six inches long, have three and a half inlets and outlets, and a straight through design. Plus, they're fully stainless steel. This finishes up all the fabbing and test fitting we had planned. Now we gotta take everything off so the track pony can make a trip to the paint booth. Then we can reassemble the parts, plus add things like a radiator, fuel lines, brake lines, gauges, glass. Well, the list goes on. We wanna do an extra good job because after we complete the build and test it at the road course, could be heading to your house. That's right, we're giving away this track car to some lucky driver. Watch for details on our website. We'll be back. Build on a budget. Horsepower projects that save you time and money. Now that the teardown's begun, let me show you something over here. The Ford Small Block has been a popular performance platform for a long time. And in high performance applications, builders have determined that there's an insufficient oiling problem at the front of the block. Well, the oil pump pumps oil to this main gallery in the rear, and then it goes to the front of the motor. Well, on its way there, it has to oil all the main and rod journals as well as the total valve train. So by the time it gets to the front, it's insufficient. Well, here's a way to fix all that for less than 15 bucks. What you'll need from the parts store are your brass fittings, some line, and from your garage at home, a drill, a tubing cutter, a tap, a drill bit, and of course, a pilot drill. Starting in the front of the motor, we're going to run two feed lines. The first step is to use the pilot bit to drill into the oil passage. Then use the larger bit to open the hole up for the tap. Now use oil when tapping the hole, or you could risk breaking it off in the block. Now thread the fittings in using a little Loctite. On the rear of the block where the oil comes from, it's the same process, just using a T-fitting. Now just connect all of your fittings with the copper line. Now some of you may be wondering, are there any interference problems? Well, the answer is no. It's under the intake line and it'll clear the lifters, push rods, and the rest of the valve train components. Now I think one of the coolest benefits of this whole thing is racers do it all the time. And now you know how to do it at home. <laughs> 